Hello, everyone, and welcome to Decoding Westworld, uh, a podcast about the HBO original series Westworld. I am David Chen. I'm Joanna Robinson. And welcome to the show, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, we are starting this podcast to recap every episode of Westworld. Uh, you can find every episode of this podcast at decodingwestworld.com. You can also email us at decodingwestworld at gmail.com. Joanna Robinson, uh, it's a few days after the Westworld season premiere. It's almost like we didn't have a plan to do this podcast when we started, but uh, consumer demand has made it so that uh, we're going to get this going. We've got a bunch of tweets asking us to recap this show, right? Yeah, it's almost like we slapped this together at the last minute. What could possibly go wrong? What possible glitches could there be <laughs> None with this at all. degree of preparation? None at all. No, uh, but in all seriousness, like a lot of people have messaged us saying that they uh, they want us to recap the show. Um, they know us from our other podcast, The Cast of Kings, uh, and The Ones Who Knock. And so uh, uh, I watched the pilot of Westworld. I was really impressed with it and thought, hey, let's do this thing. And I think you're recapping the show for Vanity Fair, right? I sure am. All right, so the format for the show is going to be perhaps a little bit different than uh, with our other podcasts. Typically, we just go scene by scene. We're going to try something more dynamic, a little bit more fluid um, for this episode uh, of the show. And so this week, we're going to be recapping season one, episode one of Westworld, uh, entitled The Original. So, Joanna, uh, what were kind of your expectations going into this? HBO had spent like $100 million dollars on this show, uh, they really need another hit, and this had been delayed many, many times. Apparently, it took multiple tries to get the pilot correct. Um, so, did you have high expectations going in? I mean, I, I was worried <laughs> going in. I think, I think when when an entire multi million dollar production shuts down for several months, which is what happened here, um, you know, there's there's some cause for alarm. There was there were some recasting, ma- major recastings, um, and. Uh, you know whether or not due to delay or the uh, the wrong actor being the part. All that being said, I would much rather they shut production down and recast roles in order to try to get something right than plowing ahead with something that's not quite right. So I don't want to fault them for trying to get all their ducks in a row. Yeah, it, um, it takes a lot of guts to do something like that to try and get the story correct in, in the right. way that they want. Yeah, uh, but you know they do have a lot riding on this, right? I mean. Uh, they don't have that many hit shows uh, in, in the can right now. Game of Thrones is coming to an end soon. Vinyl didn't hit in the way they wanted to. Yeah, the, uh, the larger background, even even further behind the curtain, like uh, if you want to talk about the sort of lab – Esque Westworld side of this is that you know uh, Michael Lombardo was the president of HBO for a long time, uh, stepped down, and most people believe he stepped down because he failed to get so many dramas off the ground. There was like two David Fincher projects. There were like a there was a Steve McQueen project. There were just like a bunch of uh, dramas that HBO tried and failed to launch within the last few years in order to try to spread their slate beyond just uh, Game of Thrones and Veep and Silicon Valley. Like, they they slowly lost all their other supporting players, and then they just really have this one huge tentpole. Um, And, yeah, so they really need another hit, uh, especially, as you say, because Game of Thrones is wrapping up. And so HBO is thirsty for this to be a hit. But also something that I noticed is that, uh, you know, Game of Thrones fans or fans of Sunday night HBO prestige drama in general are really thirsty for this to be a hit. I saw some people on Twitter being like, please be good, Westworld, please be good. Like, they really want it to be great. They really all want to, like, be able to talk about this every Monday morning and and have something really, really beautiful and uh, entertaining and with some depth. So a lot writing on this show. Agreed. And yeah, people are hungry for another show like Game of Thrones. The question is, can Westworld do for sci-fi what Game of Thrones did for fantasy, make it mainstream? Certainly the early results are promising. Uh, 3.3 million viewers uh, and you know, uh, rerun viewers uh, like within the first 24 hours of the show coming out. Uh, that's around the same as True Detective Season 1, which was widely regarded as a success. Uh, so... It's, sure, it's got but, a strong start. Go ahead. But, but True Detective built its audience. And, like, to put it in better perspective, like, uh, Game of Thrones gets 23 million views per episode. Sure, but so Game of three, Thrones season one only got, like, the season premiere like, only got around 4 million uh, views. No, less. Uh, less, like, 2 million. Like, gotcha, yeah. Yeah, yeah. No, so so for sure. It could build an audience. I'm just saying it's not, it's not like, a, a huge mass, mass hit 
right out the gate. There's right. a lot. There's a lot of interest, though. Yeah, 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 yeah. And uh, as evidenced by the fact that we're sitting here talking about uh, season one, episode one. So, uh, so let's dive into season one, episode one. I guess uh, I, I want to talk about kind of some of the specific plot lines, but uh, overall, what did you think of this episode? I mean, it's gorgeous, right? Like, you just can't deny, it. like, you know, when, when someone says they spent $100 million on something, you like to see it. And I think we all see it on the screen here. Um, you know, the, I guess my biggest complaint about this episode, and I have a few, uh, is that I, I think as far as a pilot goes, it just had so much work to do. It's an hour, it's an hour and a half running time, right? Um, uh, 70 minutes around. Okay, yeah. seven, 70 minute running time, a lot of world building, and a lot of characters to introduce. Yeah. Game of Thrones, of course, had a similar job. Um, but, you know, I would say that there are a lot of characters they're asking us to track, and we will meet even more next week. So... That's my, my plus minus. Good performances, very gorgeous. And this is actually my, my assessment of most uh, Nolan Brother projects. Uh, great performances, dazzling visuals. I'm a little worried about the intricacy of the world building. Yeah, you know, I was expecting this episode to be a mess given what we'd heard about it. And apparently, like I said earlier, they took multiple bites of the apple. Like they tried multiple times to get this pilot right. And overall, I thought they did a good job. You know, I was tracking all the characters. I, I kind of understood some of the major conflicts that the show is setting up, um, but still found the first episode to be like fairly satisfying uh, and very intriguing and, like you said, beautiful to look at. Um, and not only that, but there are some things in this episode that are so good from a filmmaking and technical perspective that like, I just feel like it is beyond anything else that we're seeing on television today, and we can get into that in a little bit. But uh, it sounds like uh, you thought it might have been a little bit overstuffed. I thought it was probably just the right amount of stuffed, given how much they're trying to do with this episode, and I thought they, they pulled it off. Uh, uh, but I know not everyone agrees with me on that point. So uh, I, I really liked uh, what they were able to do with all the multiple plot lines. So uh, we're going to dive more into specifics about the plot lines. But uh, one thing I wanted to ask you is kind of like, what are your favorite elements of this episode specifically? I think the showstopper for me of the episode, the the scene that made me so excited for the potential of this show is when um, – <clears throat> <clears throat> Jeffrey Wright's character, Bernard, Anthony Hopkins' character, Dr. Ford, are um, interviewing the the android who played Dolores' father. Um, uh, Peter Abernathy is the name of the android. Uh, Louis Hertham is the name of the actor. And this is like a glitching, malfunctioning robot who's like quoting Shakespeare and threatening these scientists. And I thought it was incredible. I thought yeah. that scene was absolutely riveting. I thought his performance was amazing. Um, for all the performances in that scene were fantastic. And this is the crux of, I think, what we're most interested to see in the show. Because like the original Westworld film, when it premiered in 1973, this is like a very straightforward these robots are this robot is malfunctioning and evil and killing people uh, there's no like real nuance to that uh, approach to the story um, Michael Crichton of course later refined it for Jurassic Park a little bit more um, and then this is just you know a, potentially a giant leap forward in terms of Issues that we as a modern technological society are currently grappling with, which is artificial intelligence and God complexes and technology that spins out of our own control and all that sort of thing. It's what has made the Terminator franchise so fascinating for so long. So I thought that was really tip the hand of the potential. And that has nothing to do with like huge sweeping vistas of Monument Valley. Like the Monument Valley stuff is amazing, but like this is just a, you know, a forehander, right? I think, because I think Shannon Woodward's characters in that scene as well. So it's four people in a starkly lit room, one of whom is completely naked. And uh, yeah, just really, really good television. Yeah. Uh, the performance by Lewis Hertham is amazing. Uh, also, it feels like they had to have had some kind of visual effects enhancement, right? If, for either for his twitching, yeah, yeah, just like some of the stuff they did just had to have been enhanced visually. I just don't know how humans could do it, but it looks seamless on the screen. And yeah, uh, so I agree completely. Like that was the showstopper of like your heart stopped when you watched that scene because it was so riveting, and you were so curious about like what is actually going on. How how is the show going to justify? 
uh, this <laughs> android quoting Shakespeare, and oh, it turns out it was from a previous uh, incarnation. You know, the android played a different role earlier right. on, and the introduction of this reveries subroutine uh, was what got it to the point where it was malfunctioning and quoting random stuff. So, uh, agreed with you completely that that was uh, an amazing moment uh, in this episode. Uh, I'll, I'll say something. Uh, you know, let's take turns talking about things we really liked. I'll say that uh, we really like the music from the episode. I thought the theme is sufficiently creepy. Ramin Javadi, who also does the Game of Thrones music, uh, did a really good job. But then there's also um, uh, player piano versions of modern of anachronistic Black Hole songs. Sun. Black yeah. Hole Sun, and there's an orchestral version of Paint It Black, which is super fun. Yeah, that's another. Yeah. I mean, that's another showstopper of the episode. I think is that that heist. The yeah. And Rodrigo Santoro plays uh, Hector Escaton, and uh, basically they uh, have a massive heist in order to compensate for the fact that they're removing a bunch of uh, the androids from the program, right? Like, right. oh, as long as we have this bigger heist, like, that'll make up for the fact that we're removing all the, like, hun- it was 200, I think? Hundreds 200 of robots. Robots, yeah. But, like, part, yeah, I think part of it was, like, kill them in story, so in order to remove them, right. but also right. as a distraction. Um, yeah, that I mean, and, and I talked about this in my recap, that, that, that was a thrilling moment of the episode. But if the show, it's interesting because the show wants to be this like meta examination of violent and sexual entertainment and what that means about us as a culture, if that's what we like to indulge in. You know, it's like HBO turning the mirror back on itself, on, on Game of Thrones, in fact. You know, like, a lot of people, a lot of critics who don't like this show, um, and I would put myself somewhere in the middle, a lot of critics who don't like the show think it's just HBO trying to do the, the usual sex and violence while trying to put sort of a thin mask of crit- criticism over it uh you know so you've got you've got these um park the people who run the park the management uh, making comments about their visitors their guests and like how they like to just go shoot things and rape people and isn't that a shame but that's the state of entertainment um and so is HBO really cr- taking a hard look and critiquing itself or is it trying to have its cake and eat it too and I think in this Rodrigo Santoro sequence, we see them like eat. This is definitely eating your cake too. This is a v- fun. I'm I'm not going to deny it's a fun, but very violent shootout. And so like the audience is just like, and beautifully set to great entertaining music. And Rodrigo Santoro looks so good in his black coat and all this sort of stuff like that. And so, um, you know, this is HBO just like handing you the. Uh, I guess lowbrow, a beaut- gussied up lowbrow entertainment um, that it does sometimes. Do you know? Yeah. Do you disagree? No, I, I completely agree. Um, I think that the show probably is going to be a critique of that element of human desire, you know, the desire right. to indulge in violent and sexual fantasies, while at the same time uh, saving those violent and sexual fantasies in, in its audience, right, by giving us that stuff. Now, uh, we have critiqued the asymmetric use of female nudity in Game of Thrones in the past uh, on our other podcast, The Cast of Kings. But uh, question for you, like, how, how did you feel about the copious nudity in uh, this episode? I actually thought that overall it was used pretty well to further the story. Like when you see a bunch of these nude androids all over the place, it makes them feel inhuman. You know, it makes it separates them from from humanity in a way that I thought was effective. Um, the biggest downside, of course, is that there's no penises, at least no fleshy, <laughs> no fleshy penises. We see like a resin penis uh, like made out of white oh, stuff. all right. Um, I wasn't yeah. tracking the penises well, this time. Well, you know, that's the difference between you and me, <laughs> Joanna. Uh, but yeah, um, what did you think of, uh, uh, of the use of, uh, of nudity in this episode? See, it's another case of like having your cake and eat it too. I think that it is – I think you can make the case that all the female – you know, it's the, the show's first shot is Evan Rachel Wood, who is, like, a significant actress and, uh, you know, B-list at, at, at the least actress, nude, you know. And we also get um, Angela Serafin, who plays the Clementine, one of the saloon workers, also nude. Uh, we get the guys nude, but, like, as with Game of Thrones, I mean, this is this is a stupid debate we have a lot, but, like, seeing a woman nude 
you know, with her legs closed is different from seeing a guy nude with his na- legs closed. Like he's just like not wearing a shirt or pants. It's, but it's different than when you see a woman's bare breasts. It's just it is is different. And within World, we saw some naked saloon girls, like sort of in a in a sexual orgy situation. Um, with guys who had their pants on. So like, you know, there's still a little bit of that HBO imbalance. Um, But I agree with you, like, especially when we get into like the cold storage sequence where you actually, I think there are some uh, fleshy penises in that scene, actually. If uh, yeah, when you're just, when you're just seeing all these people stock still, that is disturbing and dehumanizing. Uh, Livestock, I believe is there referred to in the show. Oh, Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, uh, that being said, uh, he, another HBO show debuts with both, uh, copious amounts of, uh, nudity as well as a female rape, uh, yep. which happens earlier on in the episode when Ed Harris takes Dolores, uh, Ed Harris's character, the man in black takes Dolores into a barn. Ed Harris character, pretty interesting character. Uh, man in black in the original Westworld was a, uh, part of the world, uh, a host as it were. And in this, uh, uh, in this show version uh he's apparently a visitor who's been yeah. coming for decades right so so we think so we I think don't... maybe he's just another part of the program uh who knows who knows we'll find out um so i think you were just talking about how you like you really enjoyed that um that robbery scene uh any other things that you really liked about this episode well, I, w- I will say, like performance-wise, I think um, Lewis Hertham as Peter Abernathy is is the standout. But uh, Sid Sabat Nudsen, who was recast, it was oh Miranda Otto, I believe, was originally cast in this role, Ooh. and they re- uh, and they recast Sid Sabat Newt- Newton as uh, Nudsen as Teresa Cullen, who's like the management, uh, the suit behind the scenes of Westworld, and. Um, she was the lead actress in the TV show Borgen, which I was obsessed with. She's incredible. She's also in, like, uh, the new Dan Brown Inferno movie. Uh, not that that's a, a great thing to look forward to, but she's incredible. Anytime someone wants to use her, I am here for it. I think she has real potential to walk away with the behind the scenes stuff, even though you have an Anthony Hopkins and a Jeffrey Wright, both of whom are really incredible. But I just, there's a next level to her performance, I think. So I did think the use of the fly motif was kind of interesting. At first I thought it was a little bit tiresome that, Oh, Hey, yeah. When they have a fly on their body and they're not touching it, it means that that's how, you know, they're a robot. Uh, and the show Kept coming back to it. I think it did it at least twice, um, maybe three times during the course of the episode. But then it all paid off at the very last moment when uh, Evan Rachel Wood character Dolores slaps her, you know, like hits the fly on her neck, indicating that like she is somehow going beyond her existing programming. Right? She's so awake. Gonna, yeah, because they know. say they say the. The hosts would literally not hurt a fly is something that Jeffrey Wright says at one point in the episode, I believe. And um, yeah, so when you see her kill that fly with a perfectly placid look on her face, yeah, uh, it's very creepy. Yeah, very creepy. I think there are a lot of questions for me about uh, how the this park works, Westworld works. You know, firstly, we should mention that in the original film that there were other worlds. Right as well, in addition to Westworld. So there's like a medieval world and a Roman world. Uh, and so it's possible we might see some of those later on or they might be future spin-off shows that HBO will do. Who knows? Um, but uh, there are a lot of questions about how the world works, specifically like how they do a reset, right? Yeah. Like how do they plug up these bullet holes and do all this stuff? Uh, there's also a question about how um, the park prevents visitors from harming each other, Right. Right. Uh, and I think, actually, this question was answered uh, in a recap on Entertainment Weekly, right? Yeah. Um, so, like, when – in an earlier scene, Ed Harris's character, the man in black, is uh, confronted by James Marsden's character, uh, who is uh, Teddy Flood. And, uh, you know, they confront each other and – Teddy can't do anything to harm the man in black. And he kind of just falls to his knees, like, in this stupefied state, you know, like, almost like he's in front of this god. Uh, and, you know, Ed Harris finishes him off. And the question is, well, what happens to Ed Harris if he tries to shoot another visitor? 
uh, according to the showrunners, uh, that like h- guns fired at other visitors can be felt, but they will not be actually harmful. Right. So we'll see if that actually plays out in the future. Uh, have a feeling that will become a point of tension. But yeah, uh, as far as we know, in terms of resetting the day, like we experience the show as like a daily reset. But maybe it takes longer. Do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, I think it's inconsistent. Actually, it's like it's one of a few like t- little things about the world that I'm not convinced they know. <laughs> Even though the showrunners often have like answers for these questions, like with the gun thing, I'm, I see their explanation, and it still doesn't entirely track for me. Like you know, they say the bullets are programmed to recognize a host versus a visitor, and will only sting a visitor and kill a host. Um, I just I see so many uh, you know ways in which that could go wrong, and I'm sure will go wrong. But like, how has it not gone wrong more before? And then also, um, yeah. So the reset is a good question to me. Like Dolores seems to reset every day. That's what it seems like, right? Yeah. Whereas, like, uh, the heists or, you know, the the adventure into the mountains uh, that, that the one couple goes on when the sheriff started, starts glitching, those storylines take, like, weeks or a week at least. Uh, so I think it's inconsistent what gets reset and what doesn't. And, like, if you're part of, you know, this other storyline that takes a week but Dolores is resetting every day, like, that doesn't – really make a lot of sense to me. Now, it's possible that Dolores isn't resetting every day. Um, If so, then, you know, her entire family dies and she gets raped and then she's got, like, six more days to sit it out until the reset. I don't know. Like, I just don't think that that is consistently plotted out. The other inconsistency I see, this is, I asked Dave before the podcast, I was like, do you mind if I nitpick some things? He's like, "Go go to town. The other inconsistency, or at least, like, Mm, muddy rule is how do you shut these androids down? Because there are all these verbal commands. We see Shan Woodward's character, um, sorry, you want me to use character names, Elsie, shut down Dolores with a phrase, right? Like, may you may you have a deep and dreamless sleep or something like that. Um, and we see them use phrases in sort of the lab setting to do all sorts of things with the robots. That being said, after the shootout in the saloon, the first shootout, we see them freeze everything like with their iPad controllers. So they've got iPad controls too. So why do they have two different ways to shut the robots down? Uh, you know, redundancy, <laughs> like if one doesn't work, the other one might work. Right, right. Like a hard, a hard reboot versus soft reboot. Yeah. Like there are possible explanations. I just think it's, um, I think when you're world building, it would be good to have like, and this is how we should not like, not that they say it, but just like, introduce one way you shut the robots or the androids down you know like i I will say i feel like it is more stuff that hasn't been explained yet rather than inconsistencies in the world and i I will say if we get to the end of a season and none of this stuff is addressed i will then wholeheartedly agree with you that they should have done a better job of world building here but uh, i'm willing to hold out hope given how much i like the the pilot and i agree with you i think i think it's probably you guys can all like sit at home and roll your eyes or laugh at me for nitpicking after seeing the first i've seen the first four episodes but like sure there's still like 10 episodes to go and five seasons to go and whatever but um <laughs> we're this, not going to get an explanation about the ipads until season five i think is really what it comes this, down to well but this feeds into my larger um <clears throat> a larger point that i made over on vanity fair which is that i have been burned by the nolans before uh via interstellar via um I I would say Memento when you look back it has a lot of inconsistencies in it. Um I I mean Inception's not Jonathan Nolan's fault, but I'm going to throw it on I'm going to unfairly throw it on the pile anyway. Like what I think and and the Nar- Dark Knight Rises, what I think the Nolans are really good at is setting up a really really ambitious brilliant premise and I don't think they're good at sticking the landing. So I worry about investing too much in this complicated world knowing that Jonathan Nolan has this spotty track record in that regard. Well, we are 25 minutes into our first podcast. Sorry. And you've already invited no. upon us 
the abuse and harassment of every single internet Nolan fan out there. Um, so thanks. Thanks, that's Nana. How, that's how I do. Well, direct your angry tweets to me, not to Dave. I will say, like, <laughs> having said that, like, I've seen every single Nolan film. I will keep seeing every single Nolan film. I find them really, really fun like and entertaining i even though i thought the end of interstellar was the stupidest thing ever like interstellar has a lot to recommend itself that being said i think when you take that flaw and you put it into the context of a television show which is subject to much more granular analysis um i i i worry okay so so here's here's where i'm worried here's where i'm worried right is is uh, I I agree with all that stuff, but it doesn't really impact. Like that didn't affect my enjoyment of the film that much, uh, or of the show that much. I agree that Interstellar is kind of a mess, and that there are incons- inconsistencies in Memento and so on. Uh, but where it impacts me is when you have a scene uh, in the show where Lewis Hertham, uh, aka Peter Abernathy, finds a photo of Times Square, and that becomes a major plot point, right? And, and there is no explanation of how world resets happen. Like, how did this photo get there? Was it a mistake? Was it on purpose? And obviously, maybe, like, the show will reveal that in the future. It's very possible. Um, but Right. What, how, is spark- how- what is sparking these glitches? Like, the reverie explanation is that, like, le- okay, so let's talk about the guy who gets bullet riddled in the saloon and is like, got milk pouring out of his bullet wounds, right? That guy, we think, is triggered by the fact that he remembers how many times he's been shot over the course of his career as an android at Westworld, and he's had enough, and he's going to lash out. Not so- only that, I really liked the milk, uh, like, the milk stuff is very strange at first, but then when they cut to, like, the resin, it feels feels like you know obviously there is a parallel of like seminal fluid with milk as you know in terms of visual appearance but also like the resin that they're made out of looks very much like the milk so it feels like they're trying to like get back to their origins in some way via that milk yeah um, that is an interesting visual motif i love that i loved it and then i also just happened to watch like all the aliens movies so yeah. you know all of those androids of course are filled with like milk and yogurt so um the and there's also a scene when Abernathy says, I wanted to meet my maker. That's a line from Prometheus. And I'm pretty sure it's not, I mean, it's not, it's a thing that people say, but like, uh, I'm pretty sure it's not a direct reference to Prometheus. It was just like the second aliens reference that I noticed, um, in that episode. Okay. So, um, yeah, so that so we understand his glitch and his meltdown and how it ties to the reverie sort of situation. But the fact that Abernathy was triggered by that photo it seems different and odd, right? Yeah, uh, I agree. Maybe the <laughs> maybe he was built in Times Square. <laughs> who, know, <laughs> who knows? Who knows? Uh, but but I'm saying you can't like you can't have that be, or rather, it is problematic to have that be a major inflection point if you don't first explain how the park is reset every day. You know, that's my position on it. Um, so that is more of a, of a bothersome to me, like from a world building perspective than, than some of the, uh, some of the things you brought up. Right. Um, but, uh, so now we're kind of talking about things that like we weren't a huge fans of, like, uh, one of the things that you're saying is how, uh, like the, the show seems to have inconsistencies that might be explained in the future. Um, uh, in terms of, uh, things that I wasn't a fan of. I, I, there weren't that many things. I was overall a huge fan of, of, of the whole episode. I thought some of the special effects uh, in the kind of meta world looked kind of rough, you know, uh, like that huge table with the holographic um, oh, Westworld yeah, looked yeah. kind of rough. Like some of the yeah. look of that world looked kind of rough to me. Um, but overall, I thought the show looked great. Uh, a little bit irritated by uh, all the whispering going on in the show. Mm-hmm. You know, Abernathy uh, whispers to his daughter some stuff, and we don't hear what it is, and maybe that's going to come into play. Jeffrey Wright ris- whispers some stuff to to Abernathy later on in the show, you know, like all that stuff. Um, and uh, uh, I'm kind of curious what's going to – I have a feeling that's going to come back. Uh, but it just – it is – I'm not. I'm okay with foreshadowing. I'm okay with mysteries. I just – I don't know. For some reason, whispering is a uh, – as you can tell by my incredibly loud voice all the time, uh, whispering is not my favorite uh, vehicle for getting that across. Uh, Anthony oh, well. Hopkins so far, his character seems like it's just Anthony Hopkins playing Anthony Hopkins. I hope there's some more depth there. Um, playing Dr. John Hammond. 
Yeah, exactly. Uh, that you know, I, I hope that there is like more to him than just an uh, old, wizened character who knows everything, uh, or maybe doesn't know some important things. Um, but uh, overall, I, I was a huge fan. Any, anything else that you want to bring up that you thought was particularly problematic in this episode? Um, well, I guess I should note quickly that in in the show, according to Dolores, what her father said was these violent delights have violent ends, right? Uh, but it looks to us, the viewer, like he said a lot more than that. Right. So, um, yeah, the, the, one concern I have <laughs> um, is that since they did, they did do a bit of a reboot after the pilot, a bit, and even later. Um, like I said, we meet three major new characters next week. And I'm worried that some of the seeds they plant in the pilot, they're just going to drop. Yeah. Uh, so like some, you know, Bernard whispering or whatever is never going to be answered because it's part of an earlier plan that got scrapped. So that, that might end up being the case. We might three seasons from now be being like, <laughs> but what did Bernard whisper to Abernathy? And it will never matter. So, <clears throat> But I just like something that, you know, to counteract my my pearl clutching and wet blanketing that I said about, you know, how they're going to stick the landing. James Marsden said that one of the reasons why they paused production for as long as they did was to map out like five seasons, I think, five or six seasons. Um, You know, and this is like all of us living in a post lost world are very probably concerned about like smoke monsters and polar bears that are just dropped there with no actual plan about how they're actually going to fit into the show. Um, so according to James Marsden, um, they do have a plan. Should we talk about the Marsden character and, and the reveal? Yeah. yeah. Okay. I mean, firstly, James Marsden, always a bridesmaid, never a bride. In the I sense was. that he <laughs> is, a, by any uh, stretch of the imagination, uh, a really attractive man, right? And oh, yeah. yet in movie after movie, keeps getting screwed over or killed. Uh, you know, in... Except for it, 29 it, dresses. Uh, exactly. Except for, <laughs> except for 29 dresses, um, he is a guy... Uh, 27 dresses, I think, is what you're oh, yeah, yeah, Please, yeah. let's get... Uh, let's get, uh, you know, the, Catherine the Heigl movies correct. Okay? <laughs> okay? Don't make those mistakes. Um... <laughs> But, uh, yeah, I mean, here's a, movie, here's a show where it's like, oh, wow, things seem to be going great for James Morrison. The show is clearly setting him up as a visitor to begin with, right? Uh, and then in a stunning reversal, it turns out he's not. He's a host. Uh, and not only that, he's a host who's doomed to fail. I did like that line uh, from uh, Ed, Harris. The, yeah, Ed Harris's character, The Man in Black, about how uh, in order for some people to feel like they win, other people need to lose. And yeah. I think that speaks to... Uh, a truth in human nature that like we might experience sometimes. So well, especially, I mean, especially if you're type A personality. But Teddy's get... plot, I think we find out we find out in the pilot or the premiere that Teddy's plot is not always to like go hang out with Dolores and then go to her ranch and then get killed. Uh because, you know, in in another plot he's hanging out with these visitors and one of them says, like, you know, this guy took this guy's crazy with a gun. He took me out into the middle of nowhere and it was this crazy thing. So like Teddy sometimes does other things in which he kills a lot of people. Um but the Marsden reveal, the Teddy reveal is really interesting to me because HBO sent these like very frantic emails to all the people, all the media people that they sent the first four episodes to saying, please don't reveal the Marsden thing. Like, right. please don't reveal it. It's a big secret. It's a big deal. The reveal happens like, as you say, 15 minutes into the episode. Um, and also I kind of, cause I watched the episodes before they sent that email. I kind of thought he was, a host anyway i think it's just marson so good looking that i'm like he must be an android or something like that like i i never was like oh my god he's not a visitor so um like for some reason i i i missed the boat on that surprising reveal but i do think it's setting up the potential for i called him a secret robot secret android whatever you want to do like future characters who we've thought were human all along who are actually androids like um I have my theories that is not based on spoiler things, but like, I think, I think it's a fun thing that we can all do is like, look at all the quote unquote human characters in the show and try to figure out if one of them like Marsden is also a secret Android, because like, why would they do that? 
15 minutes into the episode. Uh, you know, Dave was saying before we started recording that it wouldn't have been more effective to do it at the end of the episode. Give you a whole episode thinking he's a visitor. Right. Um, I know that, uh, that that's kind of a ridiculous suggestion because – they reset. Uh, because they reset and they, you know, they need to convey all this information. But that is typically how something like that would be structured on a TV is you would have this person. And then at the end, you're like, oh, my gosh, dramatic reveal. That person is actually a host. You know, uh, they, they would typically draw out the mystery uh, of that a little bit more. But, you know, Joanna, you bring up kind of crazy theories. Um, Peter Serretta at SlashHome.com has written up a post called Eight Mind-Blowing Possibilities <laughs> About Westworld. Um, all right. A lot of theories. Right. I'm ready, yeah. So one of the theories is, of course, that some of the human characters are actually robots, yeah. right? Uh, and so you, I, I think that this is a highly possible theory, right? Yeah. Like that we, uh, we see that, you know, Jeffrey Wright's character is a robot. Or, or here's another theory kind of that takes, uh, expands on that, is that that whole outer layer where they're kind of monitoring Westworld, like that in itself is a simulation of some kind, Right. Like, it, there's actually a, a, a deeper meta layer on top of that world um, that, like... Whoa. The, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. How, what so, do you feel about- so, so it's, like, Westworld uh, and then, like, Corporate World? Yeah, that, like, and then okay. people, like, like you know, they're playing well, Corporate World. Well, <laughs> like, <we're, laughs> people pay money to pay Corporate World. We're going we're gonna to see, um, you know... I. Uh, I'm trying, you know, we we respect the spoiler rule on this podcast as we would any podcast. I don't think it's too terribly upsetting to say next week we will see how people go into the park, which we did not see this year. I mean, this this episode, right? Like we, well, while we're recording this episode, two is already available online. But yes. like, uh, we, you know, we will see people enter the park. And um, <clears throat> by my reckoning, watching that, and you guys can disagree, and we'll talk about this more next week. Uh, it's still unclear to me. I think it's still possible that Westworld is like virtual reality versus hmm. actual a physical thing that you engage with. I think my theory is way more likely than that. Mm-hmm. that oh, you know, corporate world? That corporate world is its okay. own like simulation of something. Okay. Um, all right. But that's me. Okay. Uh, all right. So uh, other theories. Uh, the man in black was involved in the quote unquote critical failure 30 years ago. Mm-hmm. Um, so you know that's that's a theory I think is is very plausible. Um, that Westworld is a test for something else. You know, like that Westworld is like is not an end in and of itself. And I think that's that's fairly, not even a theory. That's yeah, that's, I, I think that's, that's strongly hinted at by uh, lot. yeah the woman in charge. Yeah, um, what what that I guess the the better theory is what is that end goal and i think like what is westworld actually being designed for is is it like uh weapons right military application right right or i think my favorite theory is is this idea that they're trying to refine the technology to get to the point where um is this is it the singularity the 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 point where we can upload our consciousness to a computer and ex- and experience robotic immortality. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So those are a couple of very strong theories for what the purpose of this entire park is. Right. Another theory, Westworld, the show, is a sequel to the original Westworld movie, um, which has uh, been issued a non-denial denial by uh, Jonathan Nolan. Uh, what did he say? He basically said, we wanted to connect to the ideas in the original film, but also take a look at this place as a cultural institution that is not new because these ideas aren't new. They stretch back to when Crichton was playing with them. We wanted to consider the park in that capacity as a cultural institution in the manner of Disney World. We feel like there's a long story there. Like there's something so pointed and sad for us about the idea that Dolores, this sort of evergreen frontier girl next door, she's been that plucky heroine for 30 years. Um, but uh, uh, according, before that, any of that, he said like he, he wrote the mention off as uh, – as playful, but not meant to be literal, like the the, men- the mention of Westworld. An incident yeah. 30 years ago. Yeah. But what's weird to me is why did they say 30 years ago when Westworld came out, like, uh, 46 years ago? Oh, my right? gosh. Has it been that long? Jeez. I think it was uh. 73. I could be wrong, but, like, it's not 30 years ago. Well, but come on, Joanna. I mean, you know, well, no, no, real-time you, real you know, movie releases are not, like, the time span of the, of the universe, right? Sure, but if you're going to pick a, like arbitrary number of years <laughs> why not just go all the way that reference the movie that came out in the 70s that's why not a, 
pick the exact number of years it's been since, you know, it's like the whole, yeah, anyway. That's just lazy world building right there. <laughs> lazy world building. You should have chosen 43 years. Well, it's That's like, I was about to say, it's like that Twin Peaks thing, right? When she was like, see you in another 25 years or whatever, 15 years or whatever it was. Uh, and that's what the Showtime reboot was aiming for. And then mm. they blew it and like are not going to make it within that time frame. Never yeah. mind. Moving on. Really jacked up. Um, <laughs> I've already mentioned uh, the fact that, uh, you know, from this uh, article that like there, we might see other worlds because there was like medieval world and uh, and Roman world. Um, and another theory, uh, Westworld is not set on Earth. Uh, yeah. Hit fixes Donna Dickens is convinced that Westworld isn't even taking place on Earth. Um, oh. uh, during one moment in the pilot, Lee Sizemore asks Teresa Cullen, when do you get to rotate home again? The showrunners have mentioned that the characters are making reference to getting leave, yeah. uh, which gives us a sense that the staff is on location in the park for several weeks at a stretch before they rotate home. This could be because Westworld is located in a remote part of the country, far from the employees' home cities, or maybe they are much further away from home. What if they are on another planet, like a terraf- terraformed Mars? See, so, yeah, I like. I kind of. I, I saw someone floating that theory last week. You know, what indication do we have that this takes place on our planet? But it seems like an unnecessarily layer, a unnecessary <laughs> layer of sci-fi. Perhaps, perhaps. Um, so, so anyway, those are some of the popular theories about Westworld. Do you have a favorite one or any one that you firmly believe in? Um, I think the singularity thing. Interesting. So that is what. Uh, the park is for it's to help some billionaire upload their consciousness to some kind of AI or something. Right. Like that. Yeah. Right. right. Um, so my question for you, Joanna, as we well, which this- is which is why, right? That Doctor Ford. I mean, whether or not it's Doctor Ford himself or working for someone, why he would keep trying to make the the robots more human with the reveries and all that sort of stuff like that. Whereas um, Lee Sizemore's character, who's like the the game master, the story, the narrative guy, his argument that like maybe we should stop upgrading the robots because they're human enough and things are getting creepy. Yeah, he makes they're such they're a- already in the uncanny valley. Yeah, of, of robots. Yeah, he makes such a great point. The only reason to keep plowing forward is to try to achieve achieve that singularity mm, sort of mm. scenario. So uh, my question for you as we wrap this up is what is the plot line you are most looking forward to playing out? Uh, like, is there a character who like you most want to see like where their character goes? This season? Well, can, can I be informed by the next three episodes I've seen? Mm, sure. Uh, Thandie Newton, who mm. we barely get in the pilot, gotcha. but yeah. her, her stuff is going to get more, more interesting. Uh, I am rooting for Dolores uh, and Evan Rachel Wood's character. She's the oldest host in the park, mm-hmm. uh, and she probably has a ton of secrets. And she, you know, if there's a robot rebellion, my guess is she'll help lead it. And I just love that last shot. It's so chilling, mm-hmm. uh, and I think it foretells a lot of what is to come uh, with regards to this park and all the malfunctions that are going to happen. So, and I should say, looking forward that in episode two, uh, Clifton Collins Jr. and Jimmy Simpson join the ca- cast. Those are two like that guy actors who I've loved for years and years and years and years. And so I'm really happy that they're on this cast. Ben Barnes, you're fine too. That's the third actor we get. You're fine too. <laughs> but Clifton Collins Jr. and Jimmy Simpson, and Jimmy Simpson's such an interesting actor. So I, I, yeah, I look forward to us enjoying all of that. Yeah. All right. Well, uh, I think that's going to bring us to the end of this week's episode. Uh, we're going to try and keep these episodes like relatively shorter than some of the like ninety-minute long Cast of Kings <laughs> episodes. But by the end of this season, Joanna, we're probably going to be recording for like two hours at a stretch. So who knows? Um, but uh, thanks for all those who asked for this episode. Uh, it's I think it'll be a fun uh, side project for me and Joanna. You can find more episodes of this podcast at decodingwestworld.com. Email us. Let us know what your theories are at decodingwestworld at gmail.com. In the meantime, Joanna Robinson, where can people find more of your work on the internet this week? You can find me on vanityfair.com or you can follow me on Twitter at Joe Wrote This. Find me at davechen.me and find my film The Primary Instinct at Hulu and also at theprimaryinstinct.com. Uh, Thanks for listening, and we'll see you guys sometime in the next uh, seven to ten days. (laughs) 